Mark Silver, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm delighted to have you back. You've just um, written a book, which which feels it's like a very daunting book to write because it's comprehensive. It's not like <laughs> I'm writing this book and there's one thing that you know is 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 meaningful to me right now, or I think can help people. You really kind of wrote a book about the, your entire system and philosophy, um, and. And I've known of you and known your work and been following you for a long time, but there was plenty in here that just hit me at a whole other level. So I just want to mm. th thank you for, you know, you've done all the blogs, you've done all the videos, you've done all the things, but there's something about putting it in a book that I think is a very generous thing to, to put out into the world. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it's an interesting distillation process. I've never had ambitions to be a published author, just... And when this opportunity came up, it was the right thing to do. I just felt it in my heart and kind of pursued it. But the, like the level of editing and work that goes into making a book is a whole, it's just a whole different level. And I'm just, I'm, I, I now know, like so many authors do, what kind of a team effort it is. And I'm just deeply grateful to my wife, Holly, and my developmental editor, Andrea, who just you know, and the publisher Wild House, who really helped to uh, make the book sparkle. It's like it's way beyond <laughs> the effort I put into a blog post usually. And it's it's uh, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that it landed so beautifully with you. Yeah. So if, if I remember later, I'm going to ask you like what you learned, what you didn't know until you wrote the book. But why don't we start with, you know, where, where my listeners are at, like, who the hell are you and what do you do? Um, <laughs> Right. So maybe start by saying that, that you know the, the the title of the book and your and a little bit of your business and just kind of re reintroduce yourself to the folks. Sure. Well, um, the book is um, heart centered business healing from toxic business culture, so your small business can thrive. You know, for the last twenty three plus years, um, I've been working with thousands of business owners uh, to people that really want to make a difference in the world. And their business has to work in order to do that. They need to make a profit. And uh, the work that we do helps people realize that every act of business can be an act of love. And um, and we work primarily with smaller businesses, micro-sized businesses. And, um, and we really – I really want to <sighs> – there's so much I could say here, but, you know, business has been – such a terrible, dysfunctional, toxic force in the world over the last few centuries, you know, since the invention of capitalism, really, um, even though commerce and trade has existed as long as humans have been around um, in various forms, um, that we need um, we, we need a, we need deep healing. It's not the only thing that's needed. Um, there's so much that's needed to have the beautiful world that we know we can have. But business, healing in the realm of business is definitely a big one. And I see small businesses, healthy, vibrant small businesses uh, being a part of the big transition uh, that can, yeah, that can help bring us into a healthier culture. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if it's got to start somewhere, it's going to start <laughs> with the people who are closest to already agreeing with you. And, 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 those, are, and those are the people who are not going into business because it's so toxic, right? And so, well, you know, if, if, if you're going to, if we're going to start somewhere, I would argue that the, you know, the kind of people who are feel called in their hearts to create these micro businesses that can be enough and can be helpful, right? Like we, they're the ones who are going to be the vanguard of, of any kind of consciousness shift. I, I think I think so for a lot of different reasons, but they're also the ones who can, you know, get hit the hardest because, you know, they don't have the deep pockets of a large corporation. They don't, um, uh, you know, it's it's easy to feel alone. It's easy to feel like the combination of the work that's that you think you need to do to make the business successful, as well as the personal development and growth and spiritual journey of trying to put a a healthy business into the world and earn your living from it. It's a, <laughs> it can be quite a lot. 
Um, and to do that solo, <clears throat> I just, it's just, it's, it's, um, I don't want anyone to have to go through that solo. You know, I don't want to have anyone to have to feel like they're all alone on the journey. You know, even a relatively small business, but one that's already a corporation has a team. There's people around, you know, and there's others to share the journey, but so many people in micro sized businesses, maybe there's a few people around. Uh, and, uh, but a lot of people start out solo and I don't want, I don't want them to feel like they have to do that by themselves because it's too, it's too big a burden for anyone to do anything in this world on our own. Yeah. Well, so one of, one of my favorite things is when I go to Facebook and I see you've written another blog post explaining why this or that prevailing ethos in internet marketing or get rich quick or entrepreneurship is harmful and utter bullshit and people should stop doing it and should <laughs> <laughs> like run away from people who do it. And, you know, it's just this, this beautiful, clear calling out. So maybe maybe we start there because I, you know, just a, I don't, you know, from from my story is I was a school teacher for many years and just I didn't want to touch business. I didn't know anyone who was in business. I didn't know how anyone made more than twenty nine thousand dollars a year. And then somehow I stumbled upon Internet marketing in 2002 and, you know, right time, right place. And, you know, was basically learning, oh, this is direct marketing for a new medium. And here's everything we know about direct marketing from, you know, Right. You know, Claude Hopkins and and all this stuff. And it was it was tremendously effective. And yet I found myself so many times feeling like, well, I could be like, I'm smarter than these guys. I could be more successful than, than my peers if I would only be willing to do the things they were doing. And 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 I couldn't articulate why I didn't want to do them or if I did them, why I did them half assed. You know, the little the little manipulations, the little tricks, the little, you know, what, one of the things I learned from my first copywriting teacher is, you know, you have bullets in a sales letter. He says bullets are supposed to wound. Right. And I was like, oh, that's great advice. <laughs> that's how you get them. And, you know, and so so, the, you know, I had a struggling business for about a decade and I was I, good at so, it, and I helped I people, and I charged good like money. That. But still, it, like it was the whole on and thing on, was on and this kind so of emotional painful, and it's so spiritual and I, life support. I, you know, most of the people that we work with, you know, some of them kind of forged ahead, half-assed, like you say, uh, because they just didn't know any other way to do it. And many people just they can't. You know, they've already been exposed to enough toxicity, maybe in the corporate world, maybe in another context, maybe just, you know, in life. And they just won't follow through if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel ethical, if it doesn't match their values. And so many people struggle in their businesses because of that or, um, you know, because they won't follow through. And I just I so support them like that's. That's wisdom. You know, I start out the book, the very beginning of the book, that if you have issues with business, that's legitimate. Like, I don't want you to get over that. There's wisdom there, and it's going to help you discern your way through, um, uh, you know, to finding the the path that that is ethical, that is heart-centered, rather than getting sucked into these kinds of um, – Oh my God, bullets are supposed to wound. I mean, you know, how dead do you have to be inside to want to do that to people just to get money from them? You know, that's a. Uh... Well, but it was, and it was almost never put to me like that, right? There was always, there was always this veneer of like, you know, if you saw somebody in a burning building and 
you know, what would you do to get them out? If they, well, like, and it's, aware, you know, the truth is that, just you know, and I'm, I was a volunteer firefighter, you, you, to run <laughs> you know, when you're rescuing people, right? they but want to get out. There's not like a lot of confusion what about what's wanted in those situations, you know. <laughs> yes, they want to get out of the building. Yes, they want to be saved. There's not, you know, it's like uh, to create these kinds of metaphors that are so inherently false. You know, and, that, and, and, you know, because I used to be a first responder, I was a career paramedic years ago. It's like one of the things that I ask people to do when they're faced with these kinds of selling tactics is if you slow everything down, it's often easier to see your way through some of the um, manipulative sales techniques if you're being subject to them because, you know, they so depend on um, people being in a reaction, being, you know, uh, agitated, being reactive, being uncomfortable or in a, emotional pain. And here we are on Zoom after uh, Riverside didn't didn't uh, hold up for us. Um, so one, one of the things that struck me the further, there were so many little mindset shifts that that occurred for me. And I really, you know, for a lot of them, it was sort of like, lagging indicators like, oh, I believe this, but I didn't know I believed it, or I didn't know how to articulate it. So one, one of the, the big ones was just that there are stages to business, the same way that there are stages to a human being, and you wouldn't ask an infant to drive a car, right? And, and just, you know, like giving people a sense of what's realistic, especially in a, in a get quick, quick rich sort of world that leaves so many people feeling like, boy, it's been a year or two and I'm not where I thought I should be. Right. Talk about like how, how you came to that realization. Well, it's, you know, it's so interesting because, um, you know, <laughs> I've been doing this nearly a quarter of a century, right? And I've worked with so many people. And, you know, after some years of doing this, I began to kind of see like, gosh, somebody needs, oh, they, they're struggling with it. They need to know this and they need to know this. They need to know this. And so we started, I started kind of really getting my arms around all the different skills and different things that not only need to be learned, but put in place. And, um, and then I saw how people were um, really shaming themselves, really uh, feeling terrible about themselves when they just didn't have the knowledge they just didn't have the experience and so people would would say you know i'd say you know okay how long did you spend learning your modality whether it was coaching or consulting or some kind of healing modality or acupuncture you know people had spent months or years learning it and then once you learn it and you start working with people working with clients it takes so much longer to actually become competent and then masterful with it. It just, it takes time, but they weren't giving themselves the same time with their business. And when I started to kind of really put all the pieces in place, like what are the pieces that really are needed? You know, I, I was trying to be really responsible as a, as a business educator and consultant and coach to, and healer to, to say, okay, so what are all the practical pieces that people need to know for the business to actually work? And when I put them, when I laid them all out, I started to yeah. kind of arrange them in an order that made the easiest sense. And I began to then see the stages, like the stages started to kind of emerge for me going, oh, there's this stage. There's, you know, I detail it all in the book that you saw, that, like you said, um, and I was at first afraid to tell people, <laughs> uh, you know, oh. a little, a little bit nervous, not, not afraid, but like, I would, I'm like, are people going to be overwhelmed? Are they going to be turned off? Like, and the overwhelming response from folks was the same one. And, I, and now I kind of depend on it is just relief. Like, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with my business. When you put it that way, it makes sense. It just takes time, you know, and I began to observe that for people who actually then followed this, followed the developmental stages, it doesn't, have, it's not exactly linear. You don't have to do it in the exact order that I lay it out, but it's helpful 
to most people if you follow the general order. And to go from like absolute creation startup all the way into the the third stage, there's a fourth stage that's optional, but the third stage, I was watching people, the fastest I saw someone go, people go through, it was like around 18 months, but usually three, four, five years with successes and making money along the way, but to get to a place where the business was really stable and dependable and felt fun, three, four, five years, and people just felt such a they felt like they could take a breath. They felt like, oh, I don't have to do this at a sprint. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. Oh, I can take my time with something to really learn it and be in integrity with it rather than slap dash all of these pieces in place as fast as I can and feel off balance and out of integrity in the process. I mean, we certainly hear both, you know, slap dash like just get it good, you know, up is better than done. And there's truth to that. There is. And but we but we also hear like, how bad do you want it? Like, you know, like you know, 99% of people aren't willing to do what it takes. And so the entrepreneur hears that, said, Well, I guess I, you know, I guess I have to spend hundred hour weeks. I have to sacrifice family, health, friends. Yeah, that's love. such a such a particular lie. You know, 99% of people aren't willing to do it. I think that's really healthy. 99% of people, whatever the percentage is, aren't willing to sacrifice their health or sacrifice the rela their relationships that are most important to them or sacrifice a sense of ethics and a sense of morality and a sense of, of care in crafting their business and helping their business develop and helping people in the world in order to chase after this impossible capitalist dream or nightmare, as it were, you know, to just try to make the most money as fast as possible. You know, I uh, we live on a little bit of property here in central Pennsylvania, and we like to garden, and we also are interested in permaculture and food forestry and things like that. And we've planted, you know, fruit trees. And, you know, we planted trees that uh, were not from seed. They were already saplings. Um, in the third year, we finally got our first peaches off the peach trees. The other trees haven't fruited yet at all. And we got a handful of peaches, like, you know, not, you know, but I know that if the peach trees survive and they continue to do well, in a few years, we're going to have way more peaches than we can eat. <laughs> and, and it just like, it just, it takes time for the tree to put that many branches in place and have that many leaves and to have the root system, right? And so it's um, to not, like we, there's so many examples of places where we bring patience, whether it's a child growing or a fruit tree or, um, you know, cooking a meal or whatever, where we just see that. And we if we can bring that same compassion and patience and perseverance, without harming ourselves to business development, of course you can do it. You don't, it's not 1% of entrepreneurs, way more, per, way more people than that can be, have a successful business um, if they're willing to give it time and willing to give it care and willing to learn the pieces that are involved. Yeah. So I feel like going, going back to an even more fundamental claim that you make, which, and you mentioned it, that every act of business can be an act of love that you are, you know, you're a spiritual teacher and healer as well in, in the Sufi tradition. I think you described yourself as a Sufi Jewish Muslim. Or, yes, <laughs> it's true. Some, com some combination <laughs> of those words. Yes. Um, so like what you're, you're, what you're also saying is that for people who tend to have a, a spiritual side to them or for whom that's important, they don't have to leave that at the door when they go to work, when they create, when they create a business. In fact, you talk about the jewel, right? That that part of ourselves that believes in something greater, whether it's a divinity or a, a mutual spirit or a beneficent force in the universe, that that business can be not only aligned with it, but a flowering expression of it. Yes. Yes. Um, 
so uh, just briefly for people who are confused by the Jewish Muslim thing, uh, I was raised Jewish, my family's Jewish, Eastern European. And, uh, and about 20 some years ago, I took Shahada and I've been a practicing Sufi Muslim since then, but I still feel completely Jewish. The two religions are not contrary to all the craziness out there. There's, um, there's no significant contradiction between the two. And in fact, the Quran mentions the Torah many times. And a lot of the stories are the same. So I just wanted to kind of say that. So in an, in an understanding of this kind of a monotheist or theistic approach to spirituality, and I talk about it in the book, there's not a belief in a big beard in the sky. We're not talking about like some angry other being that's sitting in judgment and kind of ordering things. It's a it's an understanding that I think that I've found in so many different paths and religions and spiritualities around the globe, which is just this this experience of oneness, that there is a oneness that we are all an expression of and that everything is an expression of. And if that's really true, which the, my own personal experiences tell me that I'm not going to try to convince anybody of that, but that's where I'm coming from then everything is that. Everything is an expression of that, including business. It's not like business, it's not like there's the oneness from, you know, that's from which the galaxies and the universe and the stars and the planets and the whole earth and the oceans and the mountains all, you know, and all of us are expressions of, except for business. <laughs> like it's not like this <laughs> special thing that's outside of reality. And so, it can be an expression of love. It there hasn't been a lot of people have not spent the time to find the love that's inherent in business as it is inherent in everything. Uh, but if we take the time to look, I, I don't believe in what I um, think of as like gas tank spiritual approach to business where you fill up on spirituality, you know, do your prayer or meditation or what have you fill up with a good feeling and then come to business until you run down again and then go fill up again. Instead, I want to encourage all of us to like, is love possible and care in a sales conversation, in your website, in, you know, how you craft your offer in how you choose your pricing and, uh, you know, your systems and your structures of the business. I believe it is. And that's what uh, my work has been about is bringing that out and uh, discovering and naming and describing ways to approach every aspect of business from a place of love and a place of um, sustainability and a place of relational connection can you know connective love based um work you know there's not a there's not there's no place in life that love doesn't belong hmm. yeah and i think a lot of folks maybe i don't know of what, of what age can remember a love-based business like, you know, maybe there there was a local tailor, right? Where it's every, you know, my kids mm -hmm. remember their their pediatric dentist who would speak in a you know Donald Duck voice and and have cartoons playing and right. You, right. Like, okay, well, you know, the guy's doing good. I mean, you know, he's got a full waiting room, he's got, you know, four assistants and three, like he's clearly successful. But it didn't look like an act. It wasn't like, you know, he the camera stops rolling and he's like, God oh, takes care of the bastards for today. Right, 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 <laughs> right. And, you know, what's right, so funny is that, yeah, well, what's funny is that so many people like I, I think that there's a lot of examples of that, of people who are like when they're dealing with their clients or their patients or the people that they're serving, that kind of care comes out naturally. And I think where people trip up is when they like, okay, so when the people are doing the billing and they're sending out the invoices, uh, do they have that same sense of connection and care and remembering like, oh yeah, this is, these are going out to human beings or we're going to set up the system. You know, uh, 
or the legal framework for the business? Like, is there a way to then express care for people? Like, mm -hmm. you know, do does an invoice need to look like some cold piece of hard legalistic thing or can it express that same kind of care? It can, it can express the care and the love. And, um, and you can build into your business um, uh, structures and supports and business models that, you know, help to care for people. You know, if people are struggling financially, is your business set up not to care for everybody? We can't expect an individual business to undo or overturn or make up for the systemic financial injustices in our system. But can it do some of that? Can it do a little bit? You know, can it care for a certain number of people? within the structure of that business. And, um, and it can, you know, people, people can do that. They can bring that same care that you have when you're facing a client to all aspects of the business. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's go there for a little bit about, you know, just sort of pricing. Cause I've, you know, I, I grew up the child of a labor organizer where, you know, the, the, the mantra of my childhood was up up with the workers down with the ball up with the wages down with the bosses right and, and i was a shop steward in in uh in a union when i was a paramedic okay. sseiu okay. local 250 so yeah absolutely uh -huh. okay so we have you know so there's that that feeling that both that that you know good up you know wages should be up but there's always this question like you know if i set a price it feels very win lose, right? If I raise my price by a dollar, then someone else is out a dollar, and that comes to me. And like, how much is it okay, right? That we shouldn't have billionaires, but aren't there some good billionaires? And you know, can right. I, how much? Like, can yeah. I go on a nice vacation somewhere in a town where there's people begging? Like, all of it comes. I know. To the I head know. There. Well, see, this is the challenge because we have these huge systemic injustices. Like in a healthy culture. There would be, you know, not not every not. I mean, there are different versions. In some healthy cultures, maybe everybody would have exactly the same. In other healthy cultures, there could be disparities where some people had more and some people had less. But in a truly healthy culture, we would not have people homeless and starving, right? While other people had so much we would be able to have a sense of collective care to make sure that everybody had you know enough to be cared for and then would some people have a little more sure is that a is that harm if everybody's being cared for not necessarily when we have um the kind of situation that we have now where um, especially here in the United States, we have so many people houseless uh, without shelter. We have so many people food insecure. We have so many people impoverished. I, you know, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but I truly think that uh, billionaires should not exist. I don't know where the line is. I don't know if anyone can just draw the line where this amount of money is okay and this amount of money is unethical. But I do know that billions are unethical. No single person should control or family should control that much wealth. Is it okay in our culture, uh, you know, for people to have a few millions so that they can have retirement, they have a nice house, they, you know, they, they, they can care for their loved ones? I don't see that as unethical. There's enough wealth here that we could care for everyone and have some, you know, and have that. Um, and I think that, um, and I don't, I think it's capitalism that creates this win-lose picture like if I get a dollar then you lose a dollar I think that it's much more people's experience that when they do have enough if they're getting help from someone they're happy to pay the person we've we've you know we go through a somatic heart-centered resonant price exercise with our clients where they check in to see what the right price is and many of our clients are undercharging because they care and because there's also, um, you know, they, they challenge asking for what they truly need. So many of us are. But the response when they come up to a, to a resonant price, a price that's really going to support them, the one that feels right in their heart, so many, they, they're not then like going sky's the limit and charging some unethically high price. They're usually just coming up to a price that's really supporting them. 
And so many times they report back, you know, when I went to my clients, I was so scared. Tell them about the price rise. But when I did, they said, I wondered when you were going to finally raise your prices here. I'm so happy to be supporting you. That is a much more common response because I think it's a much more common response for us to care for one another. I want to see you do well. You want to see me do well. We want to care for one another when we're put to extremes and when, you know, someone is starving and when someone doesn't have a home, people have different kinds of reactions to that kind of trauma. But even when that happens so often, people are still helping one another. There's still a spirit of generosity. The only time where we really consistently see people kind of withdraw that sense of generosity is when they become ultra wealthy. It's not across the board. It's not universal. There are plenty of people that are generous when they're ultra wealthy. But there's also this, um, they've done studies to show that when somebody becomes ultra wealthy, again, I'm talking hundreds of millions, billions, you know, like these unethically high amounts of money, that more money that they could spend in generations, you know, uh, they can buy multiple houses and boats and have so much money in the bank and still have more than that and still want more than that. They've shown that people, when they're, when they have that kind of wealth, they begin to believe falsehoods. They begin to believe, oh, it's because I'm better than other people. It's because, you know, they don't think of the, the fortune they have. They don't think of the exploitation that was necessary for them to gain truly that much money. And, um, and it disconnects you. It disconnects you from what I think is a really healthy interdependency on each other. And um, yeah, and that doesn't kick in when you have enough to retire on and to care for mm -hmm. yourself and to have a nice vacation, but it kicks in at higher levels. And I think we have to, we have to really guard our hearts, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of the people who are listening to this are probably like your clients undercharging. Right. right. So what, you know, that comes with a cost in turn, right? It's not like, um, you know, I was, I was reading another book that talked about like had these quadrants about whether you're, you know, sort of me centered or we centered and whether you're expansive or extractive. And it's like, and they talked about the quadrant that is um, we, but extractive is called people pleasing, right? Where you're mm, right. You're, well, not, you're trying you're to get your actually... needs met. You don't, you've been probably usually people that have had some kind of trauma on them, or if they've been, you know, you, you know, women that have been subjected to so much sexism and patriarchy where they've never had the freedom to be able to clearly state their own needs without getting pushed down, you know, find sideways ways to get their needs met. You know, that's a, that's a, function of systemic injustice and when people are are caught in that it's like I, that sounds like a really brilliant what's the name of the book that sounds like a brilliant uh, um if you remember called become becoming coachable oh interesting it's, well i think it, it sounds like a it sounds like a brilliant insight into that structure yeah and, then, and their point though know, they're they're not trying to you know dig into the traumatic um <clears throat> antecedents but but rather just pointing out that people pleasing is not actually the same as helping your community flourish. Right. Right. Because you, and you talk in the book about like you, if you need to get your needs met, just don't get them met where they can be met. Don't get right. the, don't get your needs for, for affirmation met in two hour sales conversations. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that, you know, I, I, I said this earlier, but I think it bears repeating is that we cannot individually make up for systemic injustices. We cannot, you know, when, when there's a need for collective care, I've seen so many people from a place of deep care say, oh, I can't charge that much because then the people that are like me that need the help won't be able to afford it. I, um, the challenge with that is that the people that capitalism that our culture demands the most from and gives the least to people of color, women, queer folks, um, are the ones that are then asked to do more for free or for less, you know, <laughs> and, 
and, and exhausted and become depleted. Just from a business perspective, if you can charge a resonant price and get that from clients that can pay you, and then you can be full, then when you get the guidance in your heart, while well, this individual, I just had someone pop up who's been in really, been a member of our community, really desperate situation. And um, I said, would it be helpful if we gave you a free membership for a year? And, you know, from a place of fullness, it's easy to offer that. But if I offer that across the board to everyone who approaches, then we don't have the resources to be able to offer it when we're really being asked by the divine, by our hearts, by a sense of collective care to help individuals. And I'd much rather see that used in a more precise manner rather than just categorically undercharging so that nobody really gets the help that they need. Great, thank you. That's that's really helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So another thing that, uh, that that slapped me in a very lovely way was your idea that that marketing is about safety. Yes. And I learned, as I said, just the opposite, bullets wound. You want to kind of, you know, find their find their 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 pain point and push it till <sighs> their eyes water, and then promise them a solution. And you're and and what was also interesting is like you had a model of like a sales letter about you know that was not different from the one that I learned from a totally opposite perspective around here's the problem, here's why you haven't solved it so far, here's my approach and why it might be different. Like I'm doing all that, but it comes from a completely different place. It's such, you know, intention does, you know, there's a saying in social justice work that uh, intention is not greater than impact, meaning that if you have an intention to do good, but you still have terrible practices, you can really still cause harm. <laughs> and that's true. However, if we let intention inform our actions, it changes those actions in, in sometimes really profound ways. So like in the example that you're talking about, uh, you know, a lot of people have this reaction to talking about um, pain points because they've been used so manipulatively, exactly the way you've described. This is how I talk about it because that's what's being taught, you know, like activate somebody's trauma response to the point where they're so agitated and then buying from you soothes the trauma response <laughs> in some way. Um, and that's a manipulative, obviously terrible, um, toxic way to get sales. However, people are still struggling. If you can see your clients as whole, if you can see your clients as divine and beautiful, and you can still see them in their struggling, there's a there's a quote in in Sufism that is attributed to God that says, "I was a hidden treasure, and I yearned to be known, and so I created the creation in order mm. to be known." That desire to be witnessed, to be known, to be seen is the creative impulse that created the creation from a Sufi point of view. And we, you know, we all have that deep need to be seen. So if you skate over the challenges that people have, then they don't feel seen. But if you can also see them as whole, you know, if I, there's a difference between like if someone's a chiropractor and they say, um, you know, you've had a terrible back injury and you're, you may never pick up your child again if you don't get your back fixed. Get in here quick. You know, that kind of energy is exactly what you were talking about. Um, it's so toxic. But you can easily say, you know, you have had an active, wonderful life. You've had, like so many people, an injury that's made it impossible for you to do certain things. We know that people can heal from these kinds of things. And I just want you to have hope that your body has the ability to heal. I have one way of doing that, you know, and if you resonate with how I work, you, you know, let's see if I can help you. It's very different. It doesn't box people in. People feel seen. They feel a sense of hope. They feel like, oh yeah, my body can heal from that. I can pick my child up again. 
but they're not like, oh, this is the only solution. If you don't come to me, you're doomed. It's like, oh, it leaves a sense of, it, it brings a sense of safety because they feel seen and, and respected and cared for. And when, when people get that, oh, my, my marketing isn't trying to grab people and pull them in, attraction is the province of love. We can't manufacture love. We can receive it. We can fill with it. We can express it, but we can't manufacture it. Hmm. When we bring that caring that our heart naturally has for the people that we want to serve, and then we think about the ways that they might feel unsafe or nervous or anxious coming in to see us to get the help, and we no, and we put that and we bring that attention to our marketing going, how can I help someone feel cared for and safe enough to at least be able to then discern whether they want my help? That is such a different way to approach marketing. It's very effective. It creates trust, but it's non-toxic. It's non-traumatic. Yeah. Well, what suddenly came to me is, you know, like 10, 10 years ago, um, there was a lot of talk around pickup artists. Like there are all these guys right, who are like, you know, the game and how, and it was, you know, it was very cool in a way, like, like the, the mind could work this way and you could, people could have this kind of power. And for a lot of young men, it was like very, it's like, finally I can, you know, I can get what I want from women. And, and there were all these techniques around like neg negging, like, you know, ignoring the woman you want and insulting her, you know, and finally what, what, what came to me was, okay, so that's a great way to attract like really traumatized women. Right. Right. Like, it like is. you're marketing, you're, you know, you're like marketing, like if you're doing trauma-based marketing, you're going to attract traumatized clients who are still acting out of their trauma. And I don't see, I don't see how you're going to be able to, turn, you know, even if you wanted to turn well, that around. Well, well, it well, it does. I mean, it works because so many people in the culture are traumatized. But nearly everyone has had trauma because of, this is a traumatic and traumatizing culture. But you're right. It does. You know, if you notice so many of those businesses have very strict no refund policies, because if they did, so many people would experience buyer's remorse, you know, and all that pickup artist stuff arises out of the fact that so many men are traumatized, they don't know how to, exp you know, they don't have access, they've had their, um, I, I know for myself, it took me years to regain access to my emotional self, to be able to be vulnerable and soft and know how to connect with people, with women or whoever in an authentic, in a caring way. And, um, and so all of these men, all of these young men are walking around traumatized. They're walking around steeped in toxic masculinity. And of course they're not getting their needs met and they're hurting and, and then somebody promises them, oh, you can get your needs met this way. And it's just, it just, it's just, it's so terrible for the women. It's so terrible for the men. It's so, it's, you know, and, and the people teaching it make money. But the truth is that their hearts are being broken also over and over again, doing that, living that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... So you talked about uh, you know the needs of these people not being met, which was an, another another one of the you know jujitsu moves you pulled on me in the book, where you talked <laughs> about neediness. Uh, like I've never heard the word needy or neediness used in any way that wasn't negative. And you think ne neediness is is divine and it's you know a good thing, and we should not be ashamed of our neediness. No, I mean, we're all needy constantly, <laughs> you know, I mean, if I don't breathe 12 times a minute, I'll die and I can't manufacture the air, you know, if I don't eat or I don't drink, like we all are needy. We're also, it's been shown over and over again, you know, that infants that don't get love and connection um, don't grow and some of them die, you know, it's like neglect is, you know, our emotional needs and our physical needs are very real. 
the problem is, is that in our, in this culture, we direct our needs in unhealthy ways in ways that don't actually get those needs met. And so <clears throat> if we are able to, in a healthy way, embrace our neediness, that enables us to find how to get those needs met to the extent that we can. And it also frees us from bringing unconscious neediness into environments and situations where they're not going to get met and they're going to, you know, undermine our business. You know, a sales conversation is not a great place to bring unconscious neediness around social connections. So many of us have deficits around neediness, around community, around real friendships, around love and care. We need to get those met. But if we try to get them met inside a sales conversation, it can really undermine the process and we won't know what's going on, you know? Um, and there's other places, like if we have a need you know, to, to be cared for, uh, you know, and to have food on the table and to, you know, or even just to be appreciated, but we bring that into our pricing or into our sales copy and we try to get our needs met there, then you start, things start to get a little twisted if we can face them head on. I talk about how one of the most important capacities that a human being can develop is the capacity to be with uncomfortable emotions. I don't mean staying in toxic situations or being abused or being in a situation where you're being harmed. But there's a lot of situations where the emotions that come up are simply uncomfortable. And if we can have the ability, the capacity to be with those without needing to soothe them or fix them or make them go away, one, we find out they're not fatal. And two, it gives us a lot more spaciousness wisdom, resourcefulness, to be able to access true sources of nourishment for those needs, rather than, you know, like I said, bringing it out in unconscious or sideways ways inside our business that undermine our ability to care for people and to care for ourselves. Yeah, and, and you know, so much of the uncomfortableness um, that we generate is a mismatch between what's actually going on and what we think, you know, what it's reminding us of or what it's triggering or what it's bringing back right. to life, right? So like one of the things I love about business is it's it's so unforgiving in terms of consequences, right? Like it can, you know, I could pretend I'm like a good person, a loving father, a, a good neighbor, a, a, you know, a, a upstanding community member because there's no scorecard necessarily but like there's there's a level of of like you know rub your nose in in reality like business doesn't let you lie to yourself around a bunch of things and and i think there's there's something bracing about saying that i'm going to take my confused life my confused mind my confused world and put it in a place where where I can see how I'm impacting reality and that, you know, that I can't make up things that there's, that there's a way in which business can become a conduit for other, other hunger for reality, as opposed to the, the, the trauma-based interpretations that I'm putting on everything. Yeah, I hear you. I agree. The only thing that I would disagree with is that business is special in that way. I think that hmm. I don't, I mean, I think that there's, you know, there's times where, I mean, my son the other day, they're teens now, my, we have twin son, teen sons, you know, was, I was, I was trying to be loving and caring, but the way I was doing it, my son said, you know, Dan, I wasn't looking for a solution. I'm like, oh my goodness. I just, you know, he just wanted to be listened to. He didn't want me to fix something. God, how often do you fall into that? And so <laughs> there was a strong scorecard. If I, if I ignore that feedback, I'm eventually going to create maybe sooner than later distance between me and him in one of my most important relationships in my life. And so I think that life is constantly giving us that feedback from all areas of our life. And it's true that because of the culture, 
in business, we pay really close attention when a sale doesn't go through, or the money doesn't show up or, you know, something like that. But I think that um, uh, those same kinds of scorecards, if you will, are happening all the time in our relationships. But if as men, especially, we're not taught to value or we're not taught how to look for those kinds of um, signs, then we miss them. And so I just, uh, but I, but I absolutely agree that with you that that does happen in business and it does require us to face the reality. You know, it's like the, the, I'm, I am a spiritual teacher. I've been trained as a spiritual teacher, a master teacher in my lineage. I teach a lot of on spirituality, but the truth is I'm a really practical person. I cling to spiritual practice with my fingertips. I was a paramedic. I was a shop steward. I do woodworking. We like working with our hands in the ground. I, I love working in business and the practical aspects. Um, healing, like privileging the inner over the outer, I think is one of the big mistakes that a lot of spiritual people, people that are spiritually focused make. The outer the physical is just as sacred, it's just as holy. And uh, we need to find the love in the sacred structures. You know, there's as much love in my heart and in that peach tree that I can see outside my window. There's as much love in, um, you know, being able to deeply do spiritual healing with a client as there is in uh, the client, the actual physical client agreement that we send. If I'm willing to put it there, <laughs> you know, if I'm willing to let that flourish and be expressed there. And so um, I don't think we need to be limited in where we find reality or where we find the love. Mm -hmm. right. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, there are ways in which for many of us, it's just a clearer thing, like in, you know, sports also, like there's a number. Like it's, it's, it's easy, you know, we, all of us can be a little bit ADHD or autistic mm -hmm. on various parts of the spectrum, like numbers kind of make it easier. Um, and the other, the other thing I want to ask you about, and this is my you know, tortured segue to, to a bullet point <laughs> that I wanted to get to, uh, is so the, 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 the other thing that, you know, that had me on my back in your book is money is not energy. <laughs> and I'm, it's my podcast, so I can say fuck. I am so fucking tired of all the people who've tried, you know, whom I've gone to for like getting healing around money, and they're saying it's just energy. And I could, and I was like weirded out that I didn't like that, or it, did, it seemed like it was, um, yeah, allowing I all sorts of horrible things to to be okay. But like until you said it, I'm like, oh my god, thank god. I don't even I don't even know what you mean yet, but thank God. <laughs> it's so true. You know, I think again, that's kind of a bypass approach is to say, well, it's just energy. You know, everything is just energy. I mean, there's a there's a truth in it in that everything is an expression of the divine. If you go below the physical, everything is just an expression of love or an expression of divine presence or expression of energy or however you want to talk about it. <clears throat> But money only exists as money in the physical plane. And we need to relate to it in the physical way. Like I, again, I'm going to bring it back to, to nature and gardening. You know, the peach tree is just energy. But if all I deal with it is energetically and I don't, you know, but we have a drought and I'm not watering it, it's the, it's not going to live. You know, if I don't, um, give it a uh, healthy soil, it's not going to live or it's not going to do well or, you know, be able to produce fruit. If I don't care for its physical needs and the physical environment that it needs, if it doesn't have light, sunlight, if it's planted in shade, there's all of these things that we need to pay attention to physically in order for it to thrive. If we're going to deal with money, yes, of course, there's a spiritual and energetic aspect that is worth paying attention to. I'm not saying ignore that, but we have to also pay attention to the physical aspects of it in the world. The fact that like, well, it's money and it's buys things and there's ways to be with it 
that are healthy, you know, and there are ways to be with it that are unhealthy. And if we don't pay attention to that, I think it's a, we're doing ourselves a real disservice. So what, what do you see as the problems with the, the pure money equals energy message? Because I, I, I know it messed me up, but I can't explain how. Well, you've I think seen, it, I, you've, you've been around the block a few more times around this well, topic. Well, I think what it does is it it then tells people that it's the, like it's it all comes it all comes back to capitalism and 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 colonialism what, and you know this Western culture. What it's a particularly individualistic way of looking at things. It's like, well, it's just energy. So if your your personal energy isn't right, then you you know then you are going to mess mm -hmm. it up. And it it doesn't give enough weight to the fact, like you know what, you can learn how to be with money. You can get help on how to be with money. You know, I guarantee you people that are very wealthy are not just being energetic about it. They have financial advisors, they have accountants, they have bookkeepers. They're dealing with the numbers of it. They're not dealing, <laughs> they're not just sitting dealing with the energy, you know? Um, so many people come to us saying, you know what? I think I have a problem receiving. And, uh, but no matter how much I work on my receiving, I'm not getting more money in my business. I say, well, let's look at the business. And I'm like, they don't understand how to hold a sales conversation. They don't have a clear offer. Their messaging isn't clear. They're not, you know, like they're, they don't have a good way of connecting with people that creates trust. You know, the safety piece we were talking about earlier, when they do that, they learn these different pieces and they put the outer pieces in place and they learn how to hold it in their heart. Suddenly they're making more money. And it's like, yeah, of course they probably have some issues with receiving. We all do, and it's worth healing, but it's not as big a mountain as they thought it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the implication is if I have trouble receiving, then I, I have to go, I can't receive, I can't make money until I've healed like every last mommy trauma that I've, you know, that I've ever experienced and that there's no way to move forward. And I think it really reifies this kind of brokenness it does. Look at all it these, does. Look, look at this this person who wrote the book telling me the money is energy is raking it in apparently. Right. Well, of course they are. They because they put their marketing in place and their sales in place and all of that other stuff. I mean, I don't I mean, <laughs> let's do a survey of all these people who have tens and hundreds of millions of dollars and find out how many of them are completely enlightened and or you know, energetically completely aligned. I mean, really? I mean, the the the, the proof I, it's surprising. It's not surprising to me on one hand, but it's surprising to me on another that 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 has gained so much traction when it's so clearly not true, <laughs> you know, based on mm -hmm. evidence on how many people are wealthy that um, have done horrible things and are completely unaligned with the good and completely, un you know, it's like what kind of energy is money if that's true you know so yeah i if that can bring you some relief um that's great i'm glad yeah so when i was preparing for this conversation the, the one thing i did not want to do was have you go through every single one of the steps of business and you know just to to kind of separate it from ethics and morality and spirituality and and love and just go through the steps but I don't want people to leave this conversation thinking that your book is a book of philosophy. No, it, no, there's some really practical stuff in there. I'm glad you mentioned. Okay. Thank you for mentioning. Yeah, could you talk? Just you know, market your book for a minute, just because I want <laughs> I want people to understand what it is. Yes. So we we do start out with the beginning of the book talking about healing around business and around money and around the fact that you can trust yourself and what does that really mean um, in a more profound way, because I found that it's really hard to get your arms around the practical pieces without doing at least some of the healing, not complete healing, but enough so that your heart feels open again to like, oh, maybe there is a way through. But then we talk really practical ways about the stages of business and what's involved in learning that. Talk of there's uh, two full chapters on marketing and how to get your arms around that. There's pieces around productivity, around how to be in good, healthy relationship with the with different types of projects in your business. It's 
like I said, we've been helping people grow their businesses and that takes work and that takes putting things in place. And, you know, is the book everything you need to grow a business? No, there's going to be, there's, uh, that would, you know, you would need many more books to cover all the little details of things. But the intention of the book is to help you have a healthier relationship to business, understand how it develops, understand the pieces that need to be put into place, get your, get your hands dirty in some of these places. And I mean dirty in terms of like gardening, not in terms of immoral, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I like getting my hands dirty because I dig in the dirt planting things. Um, and um, and then be able to tell like, oh, I now understand why my business isn't working or what it needs in order to develop. And I know, and now my heart is open enough that I know that, oh, I need to be able to learn this piece. It helps you know where to focus and how to really develop your business over time. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's, you know, there's lots of great people who can teach those things, you included. But one of the mm -hmm. gifts you give the reader is, a kind of a um, a discernment about how you know how to protect yourself against predatory business teacher marketers, right? It's just there's a yes. beautiful moment where you're just like, oh, you stopped in a sales conversation where you're being feel felt like you're being pressured for you know a fake false sense of urgency, and you said, boy, this this doesn't feel ethical. In fact, I teach sales and I teach that this is an unethical way to proceed. <laughs> <laughs> so like, like again, as you said, slowing down, slowing it down, and and here listening to your heart. Yeah, exactly. So, last question: You wrote a book, much harder than a blog post, much harder than a hundred <laughs> blog posts. I'm curious what you what you knew at the end of writing the book that maybe you didn't know you knew, or that kind of you know arose from from taking on a project that big. It's a really good question. Um, I don't know if there was anything, I mean, I've been doing this for 23 years. I don't think there's anything that was like completely new. Um, but I think one of the things that I really, that was really reinforced and deepened in me is how much anything worthwhile being done can't be done solo. Like I had so much help getting this book written and getting it out into the world. And over and over again, I needed help applying my own, I won't say my own, the principles that I've discovered and learned or, you know, articulated. Um, I needed help too. I needed help too. And you know, I, I think that that can be a challenge that's, uh, you know, like, you, you know, so many people are like, I'm a healer and I'm sick. It's like, well, you need help too. You know, I'm, mm. I help people develop businesses and I need someone to help me too. Like we need help. We're not meant to do this alone. And a healthy culture healthy life, a, a, a life full of joy and love is a life that's lived at least in part. I know we all have different amounts of, you know, introvert, extrovert, how much contact, but we can't ever do it truly completely alone. We need to, we need to be the earth for one another um, and to lift each other up and to care for one another. And to do that, yes, of course, we we give care, but we also have to be willing to receive care and to be humble enough to do that. And um, it's been one of the most tender, vulnerable things I've done in a long time is asking people to help me get the book out into the world. And, and it's been really uh, a beautiful, affirming, supportive experience being vulnerable in that way. I love it. So yeah, we have to take take our own medicine, right? It's true. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Um, anything you want to say about the book or anything or about your business? We should talk about your business br briefly so people know where to find you. Yeah. Um, Heart of Business lives at heartofbusiness.com. 
uh, on the home page, if you scroll down, you can download an excerpt from the book. Yeah, the book. Yay. Um, uh, you know, it's a book, you know, like a lot of times, like getting learning or training or coaching is an investment, right? It costs money to provide it. It costs money to get it. It's worth it. But, you know, take your time figuring out who resonates. If you've taken anything away that's positive from this, from what I've been saying, but maybe I don't personally or our approach doesn't personally resonate, find somebody who does and learn from them. Um, but, you know, a great way to dive more deeply into what we're doing is to start by getting the book, to get on our email list, to, um, to like let us send you help and see if it resonates. And then if it does, you'll know if you want to get, you know, get more help from us. Mm -hmm. Great. Is there an audio version? Um, not yet. Okay. Um, it's not currently planned for, meaning that we just launched this and I would like to do that, but there's nothing been scheduled yet. You know, we'll okay. see would, how it all would you Would you Would you be the reader? I hope I so. Hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I'd like to be. Excellent. All right. Mark Silver of Heart of Business, author of Heart Centered Business. Um, thank you so much for writing this book. I, I got healing from it. Um, I hope and thank you for you know sharing your spirit with us here. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of what readers, watchers, listeners um, will, will find balm in it as well for their own um, journeys of contribution and love. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here, Howie, and for the work that you do in the world. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you again soon. Yes, I hope so. Peace. Bye. Peace.